plant to share with you this morning from our farm down in southern Indiana, where I grew up. Today, I'm a psychiatrist in New York City, where I take care of my patients and their brains. You could say it has been a trip from farm to pharma. <laughs> and I'm here today, and I won't be uh, even joking about it, I, I want to change your brain. And I want to change your brain, not with my usual techniques as a New York City psychiatrist, no mind-altering drugs, no interpretations about your mother. I want to change your brain with an invitation to change how you think about food, to put your food right at the center of your dietary choices. It turns out that our American brains are in trouble. This modern diet that we're eating of highly processed, highly palatable foods, foods that come in packages, foods full of sugar and refined carbohydrates and the wrong fats and a host of new chemicals, they are actually shrinking the human brain at a rate we've never seen before. Soon depression will be the leading cause of disability in America and the leading cause worldwide. 40 million Americans have anxiety disorders and 25% of the women that you know will someday have clinical depression. And a few years ago, I, I changed how I was thinking about our brain's health. I started going back to our family farm, and I feel it holds the key to all of us, our collective brain health. It started with a patient about five years ago. She came into my office, and she was feeling down and blue and depressed. She was an intelligent and creative woman, but she had symptoms that many of us have. She couldn't sleep. She was anxious all the time. She felt low energy. And I, I had done my very best to help her. I had given her my best thoughts about her psychology. I had given her the best medications that I had, evidence-based treatments, medications to, to boost her mood and to calm her down and to help her sleep. And as her physician, I was failing. She was still blue and sad and anxious. And, and I flashed back to my very first day of medical school, right over here in Jordan Hall. As you walk in, if you look up, carved into the limestone, it says, the nature of the human body is the beginning of medical science. And at that moment with that patient, I so badly wanted to know what was the nature of this human body, of this human brain that was not functioning well. And I couldn't know at that moment. And so out of desperation or frustration, I asked her a question that we don't really hear much in healthcare these days. Maybe your doctor has never even asked you. I asked her what she'd eaten for breakfast. And in that moment, both of our lives changed. It turned out she hadn't eaten breakfast. She was on a juice fast. She was trying to energize and detoxify her body. She hadn't eaten meat or seafood for years, concerned about her health. She had not eaten any fat because she was convinced that fat would make her fat, and she hadn't eaten any eggs, of course. No, that cholesterol. It struck me as very strange. We were both working so hard to help this brain be healthy and vibrant and happy, and it hadn't gotten any of the nutrients that a happy, healthy brain actually needs. She jokingly told me that she had come for my pharmacy, for the many evidence-based treatments that I have, the many medications that I can offer patients. We know that about 12% of adult Americans take antidepressants. They are now the most prescribed class of medications in America. And that rate has doubled in just 10 years. And part of that is good news. That means more people are getting treated. That means we're decreasing stigma. That means we are all having a national conversation about what is going on with our mental health. But I wonder what else could we be doing? What more could we be doing? This is a horrible epidemic that is upon us. What if we jumped into mental health by building the best brain possible? And so I've been obsessed with this question, can you eat to build a better brain? If we feed a brain with these foods, with whole fatty fish, full of those omega-3 fats that your brain is actually made of, and, and whole fruits and vegetables and nuts and beans. If you eat that way, do you have a healthier, more resilient brain? See, back on my farm, I felt like I'd discovered a whole new class of medications, a whole new drugstore. Back on the farm, I found the pharmacy. 
And the nature of that human brain seemed clear to me. The nature of that human brain is that it is made of whole, minimally processed foods. Now, the brain is an amazing organ. We talk so much about diabetes and heart disease and cancer when we talk about what we eat, but it makes sense we should talk about our brain. Just 2% of your body weight, it consumes 20% of all the food that you eat. It's about 60% fat, specifically a lot of those omega-3 fats, and it has high concentrations of nutrients like folate and iron. It is an amazing organ, 100 billion brain cells that reach out and they connect with thousands of other cells. Your brain is actually electric and everything that you're experiencing right now at this moment, everything you're feeling and thinking, every movement, every sound, it's all coming in through your brain. The most exciting piece of neuroscience these days, of brain science, is that your brain actually grows and changes, something we didn't know back when I was in Jordan Hall. It's a new discovery. We found a molecule called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's fancy science talk for we were looking in the brain, we found this molecule, you put it on brain cells, they grow, they thrive, they make connections. A hundred billion cells reaching out and connecting to 10,000 other cells. If you do a calculation, it turns out that your brain, that your unique human brain has more connections than there are cubic meters in the entire universe. Your brain has a universe of possibility. But that universe gets smaller and smaller if you don't feed it the right foods. Nothing illustrates this better than the legend of the vampire. <laughs> in 1500s, in Europe, food suddenly had changed. There was a new food, a tasty food, and it spread throughout and became a basis of the diet of the poor. This brand new food called corn. And you may think of a vampire as a, you know, sexy undead person who races around drinking blood, but that's not true. In real life, vampires suffer from a medical condition called pellagra. And they look like this. This man has only eaten corn for years, and he doesn't come out during the day because of that horrible rash on his skin that the sun burns. He's aggressive and irritable and angry. He's restless and he gets into fights. He craves all kinds of strange foods like bugs and blood. But the problem is he's only eaten corn. And when Christopher Columbus brought corn back from the New World, he forgot a secret that we've always known, traditional people have always known, that when you eat corn and subsist on corn, you have to soak it overnight in lime that releases vitamin B3. This man has pellagra, a condition of vitamin B3 deficiency. And it's all to say how our brains can change, how when we change our food, we change our mood, we change our brains, and we come up with all kinds of explanations for it. And think about how much we have changed our food, more in the last 100 years than in the past 100,000 years. Food doesn't even look like food anymore. It doesn't come from farms, it comes from factories, thousands of new molecules that we've put into our food supply to color our food and enhance our food and preserve our food. We've changed the way that we consume our food on the run, in a car, with our heads in a screen. We've changed the way that we calculate what is good for us. We count calories. Imagine a soda, 140 calories. And there's not one good thing for your brain in here, just sugar. We know that Americans are eating plenty of that. The average American eats 32 teaspoons of sugar every single day. And then compare that with a medium-sized kale salad, four or five cups of kale, also 140 calories. But with those calories, oh, you get 500% of your vitamin C, 3,000% of your vitamin K, 1,000% of your daily need of vitamin A, not to mention folate, calcium, magnesium, protein, fiber. Which do you think is better brain fuel? And the science is pouring in. When we look at women and they eat more processed food, they increase their risk of getting depressed by 60%. People who eat the most trans fats, those partially hydrogenated oils that you're only going to find in processed foods, you drastically increase the risk of getting, feeling blue or getting depressed. And our kids 
our children's brains, the most dynamic time to have a brain when you're a child. When we feed our kids junk food, we double the risk of depression. We double the risk of attention deficit disorder. This morning, I woke up to an email from a woman that I'd met at a conference some months ago. Every morning, she wakes up and she drives her Honda Accord around upstate New York to organic farms collecting eggs and produce, and she takes them back to her school where she cooks home cooked meals from scratch for those kids. She asked me if I remembered her. Julie, I can't forget you because what you're doing is you're saving brains. We know if we look at studies of kids, when we take them off the junk food and we put them on whole unprocessed foods, in just six weeks, 80% of them have improved behavior by both parent and teacher rating scales. 50% of those kids no longer meet diagnostic criteria for attention deficit disorder. Real food heals brains. And that's what happened with my patient. We started eating food. We started talking about salads and where to find fresh seafood. I convinced her to eat an egg. She started feeling better. She started dating. She got married. She had a baby. Food is medicine. We know that from the very first doctor, Hippocrates. Let thy food be thy medicine, and thy medicine be thy food. 3,500 years ago. And science is telling us these molecules in whole foods, like the flavonoids, they, they not only are antioxidants, as you might think of them, but they actually change how your genes get expressed. Your genes aren't your destiny. And these molecules that you find in whole food improve the situation for your brain, improve your brain's health. Now, a lot of people are telling you what not to eat. Don't eat meat, don't eat wheat, don't eat soy, don't eat dairy, don't eat fat. And that's a problem for me because I am an eater. I love to eat and I love food. I love to grow food and harvest food and to share food with my friends and with my family. And so I thought it would be best for my patients and for my patients' brains if we could talk to them about what to eat. If with whatever prescriptions they get, they also get a brain food prescription. Foods that they like, foods that you like, foods that you can eat at every meal. So what's a brain food prescription look like? Well, it's got a lot of plants in it, lots of leafy greens, that source of folate and fiber that keeps you full. Look for lots and lots of colors, tomatoes and watermelon full of lycopene that protect that brain fat. I want you to see, whoops, I want you to see whole grains and legumes and lentils like this great salad that my wife made, or soup that my wife made is covered in garlic chives. And go always go for the couple color purple. It's great for your brain no matter what. Look for colors and lots of plants on your plate. And fungus, a great source of vitamin B3, the niacin, that would have prevented that poor man from developing pellagra. Eat lots of seafood and fatty fish because it is the source of those omega-3 fats. And if you don't like fish, I challenge you, there are a lot of fish in the sea. Try other types. <laughs> and don't forget the mollusks. Oh boy, these are the foods that your brain evolved eating, full of vitamin D and B12 and more of those omega-3 fats. What and you can even eat red meat. You can make a better choice, get rid of those industrial meats and those processed meats and the deli meats and instead eat whole, real grass-fed meat. It's got fewer calories and better nutrients for your brain, a better mix of fats. A brain food plate looks like this. Lots and lots of healthy, delicious vegetables, a nice piece of nutrient-dent grass-fed lamb coated in rosemary. It's savory, it's delicious, and it fills you up. Eggs, don't forget eggs that are a great way to start your day. You don't need to fear dietary cholesterol. In fact, your brain is the largest deposit of cholesterol in your entire body. This is a healthy breakfast. And don't forget beans. People say it costs too much to eat right. I challenge you, dried beans, $2.29 a pound in Manhattan. And <laughs> there's my wife soaking them for us. We eat them every week. And don't forget berries, a great source of sweetness in your diet. Of course, we crave sweetness. And don't forget the most medicinal food out there, dark chocolate. In between these berries are cacao nib. Now, you might know this already, but chocolate's one of the few foods that foods have been shown to boost mood, has been shown to boost concentration and boost blood flow to your brain. So remember, your brain, your unique human brain has a universe of possibility. And with this tool, <laughs> you decide how big that universe is going to be. So I ask you, 
What are you going to eat for lunch? 